a dialogue, a conversation. There are going to be a couple of phases to this process. I'm going to take, as Robert mentioned, the first section. I'm going to introduce some of the elements. And then I'm going to bring some, a group of students from a local high school that are actually in the process of doing some critical education, fascinating experiment. And they're going to share with you some of their insights. And after that, we are going to open up for discussion and questions and answers. Um, a little bit of my background, uh, I am a psychologist. I am a faculty member at the University of Illinois at Chicago. I work with uh, people with disabilities and I am a professor in the Department of Disability and Human Development. When I was a 13 year old, I went to the seminar. I was going to be a Jesuit priest. And uh, unbeknown to me, uh, this was 1969. In 1968, there was a congress in the city of Medellin when liberation theology was launched. And, you know, uh, this caused tremors throughout all the religious people in Latin America. And my teachers, the people from the seminary, were very close to that process. And to my benefit, what they did was to engage me and expose me to something like this. And I didn't know. I was going to be a priest. But instead, they took me to the poor. And they said, you are going to become a leader. And you are going to change. And you are going to become an agent of change. And forget about the seminary. We are closing the seminary. And they did close the seminary three years later. Which was lucky for me, because at my time and before my time, you will start a seminary at 13 and never leave. You will never know what a woman tastes like. And yet you will be doing you know, all kinds of work with the community people in, the, in all dimensions uh, without really you know, knowing anything about life, which is, for me, was a, quite a grateful and a coincidental situation because that, I thought that was going to be my destiny. Anyway, that is to put it in context. So you know a couple of things about me. I was going to be a priest. I turned out to be a psychologist here. And I came from Colombia, South America, so I am an immigrant, and I have been here in this country almost 30 years. Um, in my presentation, and you can see from the title, I am interested in the issue of the crisis of consciousness because of the lack of critical uh, views in the educational system. And the general context is, why? Why is it that we as educators, and I am part of the problem, because I am one of them, I do my role <laughs> as a university professor, uh, why is it that we are allowing the kids to go through years and years of education without truly getting an education? Meaning, developing a critical view of the world and their own capacity to transform it. That's the most important message that Freire is telling us. Because no matter what your degree of education in life, no matter how illiterate you are, Freire will say there is potential, and you have that potential to change your own world, to transform it. You might think, well, there is something, or somewhat, or somehow, benefiting from the fact that our kids are not getting critical education. They are not developing a critical view of the world and themselves. My argument is, and that is not in mine, but as is shared by many other people, is that society benefits from <coughs> having a very large, mindless, consumer population that are just going to buy whatever it is that they want to sell them without critically thinking and reflecting about that act. So in a way, the system doesn't benefit from having people with a critical view of themselves and the world. One, because they are going to stop buying the crap and the things that we don't need. That would be a problem. And second, because they might act to change the injustice in their life. And then, that creates a problem. So, as you see, there are some fundamental forces in play to maintain the status quo and to prevent the kids from changing the world. 
The fascinating thing, which we are watching and witnessing now, is what's going on in the world. Who is transforming the Middle East? Young people. Not guys like me, or most of you, <laughs> the kids. They are the ones out there, the in and the out, and they are the ones dying for the cause. It's fascinating. Now, as the Chinese court says, you know, you are living through interesting times. Yes, we are, and it's fascinating. You, Rob, you mentioned Wisconsin. It's fascinating what is going on in Wisconsin right now. One of the most important struggles is not about the benefits. It's all about the rights of the workers to exert, you know, the power as a group. And if we let that go, we might well, as well close shop and forget about it because that will be the end of the union labor movement. So that's why people are there and they don't want to stop because this is fundamental. So we are living to fascinating times. The world is changing and the world will continue to change. But as educators, as an educator, I question myself, what I'm doing, what am I doing to help my students develop a real education? Not about facts, because you look, the facts now are everywhere. Easy. We don't need so much now to remember everything, because now we have it. Everybody has these things. So that's the facts. So if we are in there just to learn facts, we are losing and wasting our time. So it has to be more than that. No? So it has to be about what is to learn, how do we learn, and how do we learn in a way that is liberating? Because Freire's message is in that direction. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Freire, who he was, in case of some of you don't know. Then I'm going to share with you some of the things that are happening around the world with his model. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of his general framework. And I'm going to share briefly also a little experiment that I did a few years with 10-year-olds. And then I'm going to open the floor to the students who are doing the actual experiment here in Chicago now. All right, so that's the presentation. So let me start by talking to briefly about who Paulo Freire was. He was born in uh, September 19, 1921 in Recife, in Brazil. And he died at age 75 uh, in Sao Paulo. There were a couple of very influential experiences in his life when he was a kid. At age about 10 or 11, during the 19, late 20s, uh, there was a crisis, the economic crisis. The family, his father, lost his job. They were poor, and for a few years he struggled as a kid. He experienced what it was to go to school without lunch and with hunger. And he experienced the, difficult, the difficulty of trying to learn and at the same time be hungry. So that experience never left him. He always kept that memory of his infancy and how he struggled. So he could relate, because his family was middle class. He could relate to the very poor who actually lived their lives and try to leave and go to a school and all, all these things while hungry and, and how he uh, struggled with that. Um, he went to law school but never became a lawyer, uh, got connected in the education, and very soon uh, he was cultivated by the idea of trying to educate the very, very poor. Uh, he was married to a teacher and they lived together for many, many years, and he got the opportunity uh, when he connected politically with the government in the state of Recife and Recife University to work with 300 sugarcane workers, totally illiterate, because you know these are these are mostly Africans uh, descendants who work the sugarcane plantations, and they are totally abandoned and forgotten. They don't have anything, and he worked with them in literacy training, and that was the first experiment that he did with the study circles. Basically, his model is a model, and I explain that uh, later, uh, that focuses on, on these small groups of, of people. He got connected with the government, and eventually, in the late 1960s, he started planning a very massive campaign of 
of cultural uh, education in the country. But in 1964, there was a coup d'etat, and he was arrested, and he had to send to exile. He went to Chile for a few years. He came to the United States, too. Eventually, after many years, he returned to Brazil. Uh, I actually had the privilege of seeing him here in Chicago. Uh, he came to Loyola University, I believe it was 95, 94, uh, to give a, a speech. And my wife, who was a faculty member at the time at the Loyola, we went to see him. Uh, he was amazing. He was getting old, but still, you know, very, very sharp and, um, and very powerful in terms of the vision that he conveyed and the, the hope that he, he has to share to all of us in regards to his, his vision of education. In the introduction in this book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, the, the preface, uh, Richard Shaw uh, says something that I want to quote to you that I found is really cultivating. Paulo Freire incarnates a rediscovery of the humanizing vocation of the intellectual and demonstrates the power of thought to, neg to negate accepted limits and open the way to a new future. Uh, he said the world to which he relates is not a static and closed order, a given reality which man must accept and to which he must adjust. Rather, it is a problem to be worked and to be solved. Freire's conviction is that every human being, no matter how ignorant, quote unquote, or submergent in the culture of silence, which prevails in our world today, he or she might be and is capable of looking critically at the world in a dialogical encounter with others. And that dialogue becomes the fundamental premises of his model of education. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, he has inspired many, many movements around the world. Here I have a PowerPoint presentation that I got from a colleague that is talking about the reflect model. The reflect model literally translates regenerated Freudian literacy through empowering community techniques. And these guys have over close to 400 different groups in over 60 countries from around the world, primarily Africa and Latin America, working with low-income and marginalized communities, indigenous populations, and the so to help them engage in this dialogue and this conversation to transform their social reality, to understand the power, the role of power in their lives, and how to change it. Um, all right. So one of the first things that he asks is, what does it mean to be really human? It's a question that I ask my students. Because when I ask them, well, you know, what does it really mean? I say, they, they ask, oh, you have feelings, you have, you know, intelligence, you have all these things, you know, well, well, but are you oppressed? Are you alienated? Are you discriminated? Are you marginalized? Are you segregated in any way? Are you abused in any dimension? And when they start responding yes to these questions, then your humanity is being diminished a lot by all these elements, all these components. So the sad reality is that the more oppressed, alienated, and marginalized we are, the less human we are and we become. Now, we don't like to think of ourselves as not really being truly human, but the point is, and Marx, you know, said that from the beginning, when he started talking about the role of alienation, about how critical it is, and how easy it is for all to lose sight of our own humanity, and about how the system of production that objectivize our existence and turn it into objects and pieces that can be discarded and thrown away and replaced any moment, make us lose our 
sense of being. So the problem is that we indeed, as long as the experience of oppression, exploitation, and alienation are not really human, we cannot fulfill our human potential as long as those conditions prevail. So the question that he poses to all of us is how can we regain our humanity? And he proposed there has to be a struggle for liberation. We have to liberate ourselves and others from oppression and from alienation and from exploitation. He uses, Freire uses from, he was very inspired by from. And you know, the, 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 from really is, is very focused on the concept of freedom and the fear of freedom. And the fundamental challenge of truly being free and the responsibility that is associated with being free. And for Freire, he equals freedom with the process of radicalization. If you are truly free, you have to challenge your alienation, confront your oppression, and avoid exploitation. So, the process of critical education is a process of radicalization. It's a process of bringing freedom to people and choices. But, at the same time, it's a process that is very difficult because the forces that oppose that change are very strong. Freire talks about the praxis of freedom, the practice of freedom. He calls it praxis. And he basically summarized that concept with two elements. On the one hand, reflection. We have to think in true dialogue with each other to understand the forces of oppression and exploitation in our lives and in our society and the forces and the experiences of alienation. And reflection is good, but it's not sufficient. It should be accompanied by action. It's the combination of being able to reflect and take action to transform our social reality that brings about the exercise of freedom. So for intellectuals, like most of you, the question becomes, don't stay there reflecting. Where is your action to transform the world? And that's a challenge. Freire challenged us. Okay? He compelled us to act. Said being an intellectual is a luxury. And it's fun and you know you can be very engaging in cocktail parties, <laughs> throw quotations, oh, I read this, I read that, look, uh, it's arrogant, okay? The three measures is in our ability to transform the world. So, point of reflection. Um, so I mentioned the dialogue. The dialogue is a critical component of the process, and he saw this as the fundamental aspect of the process of education and bringing about a critical view of the world. And it's not just for people to talk with someone, somebody that is knowledgeable or professional, no. It's even allowing people to talk among themselves. The oppressed, the exploited, the marginalized, the, the indigenous, the people in the favelas in Brazil, the low-income neighborhoods, barrios. He doesn't tell us, oh, we need to bring all these intellectuals to tell these people how to change the world. No, that would be arrogant. We are facilitators. I see myself as a facilitator, but I'm not the one that changes the world. I help other people see their capacity to transform it. So the dialogue is critical, and, and the students from Proviso High School are going to share a little bit about how they are planning to engage the students in the high school in this dialogue. Uh, one of the other elements that Freire critiques from the perspective of 
and our model of education is what he characterized as banking education. And it's really interesting, but that's the predominant way of teaching anything to anybody. The model is very simple. The teacher makes the positive in people's heads, then <laughs> asks them to spill it out, then they to withdraw it and throw it away, and then deposit any more. And that's a process that continues for years and years and years on end. What is left is not much, because we forget, because most of that learning takes place in short-term memory. The focus is learn it, spill it out, forget about it, learn something else, spit it out, and forget again, and go on. He characterized this in several ways. For instance, he said, and I quote, the teacher teaches and the students are taught. The teacher knows everything and the students, the students know nothing. The teacher thinks and the students are taught about. The teacher talks and the students listen meekly. The teacher disciplines and the students are disciplined. The teacher chooses and enforces his choice or her choice and the students comply. The teacher acts and the students have the illusion of acting through the action of the teacher. The teacher chooses the program content and the students who were not consulted adopt it. The teacher confuses the authority of knowledge which his or her own professional authority gives him, which he has set in opposition to the freedom of the students, which they don't have. And the teacher is the subject of the learning process, while the pupils are mere objects. He elaborates a lot on this. I encourage you to take a look at this. But it's fascinating because it's a reflection of my education and probably all of your education, except for my stunt with the priests over there. But, you know, primary education was traditional, you know, normal, with the nuns, boom, 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 you know. I was even subject to punishment occasionally for not memorizing the capitals of the world, of the rivers, or the mountains. I don't remember what you could have hit for anything. It doesn't matter. I don't even remember why. I don't remember that I got hit. <laughs> so the issue is, what are we doing? We are engaging these kids for 12 years, asking them to learn stuff that they don't really care to learn. And not much. I ask my students, well, how do you learn, for instance, to engage and express affection properly? I was teaching the other day on Monday, it was Valentine's, you know. Who told you about how to express your affection? How to express or handle your anger or problem solve without having to hit people or kill people? What about, you know, self-esteem and, and getting to love yourself? Where did you learn that? You know? How do you learn to discover your own strengths, your own weaknesses? How do you connect with others? in a way that is engaging, that opens up yourself, that makes you vulnerable, that, are you, that makes you lose the fear of engaging others in your life. And you know, it's sad, because we spend all this time doing all kinds of things, and the fundamentals of how to live, we don't know. And then we messed up, and we learn by watching the stupid soap operas or the worst scenes, role models that are there in the media or whatever, which is totally the, the wrong thing to follow as a model. Growing up in Latin America, soap operas, oh my God, those are big. But it is deceit, hatred, um, uh, uh, revenge, uh, envy. That's what it is. That's what it's all. That's what the heroines all. All the, 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 the soap operas are always portrayed. The negative aspect of humanity because that's what sells. And unfortunately, that's what people learn about social relationships. How to deceive, how to entrap, how to manipulate, how to blah, blah, blah. But to be decent human beings, nobody is teaching us that. And I am convinced that the school should pay more attention to that. 
There are some interesting programs right now going on in the city and in the country. For instance, teaching the kids to problem solve, so they don't necessarily end up, end up killing themselves in the parking lot. Dealing with anger and emotional education and dealing with emotional intelligence and so forth. But coming back to this, the problem of banking education is that we are missing the point. We are not teaching the fundamentals of true education, and the kids are coming out without a critical view of the world, and they are convinced that they cannot change it. And that's the fear. But because if the kids don't know that they can change the world, nobody's going to do it. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. Those are the kids. So, how can you get this to happen? I'm going to share with you one model. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of pages and I will finish. Uh, of a project that we did with a group of graduate students from my university. They were in the program in psychology at the time. And some friends that I have in the neighborhood over there, African Americans. They heard me talk about this in my class and they became interested and we run a circle with adults. And as a result of that experiment, people were confronted, well, what do we do? So one of the, the issues that came out in what do we do was that one of the participants was connected with the volunteers uh, in Chicago. I can't remember the name of that, but it's basically bringing college kids from nice universities to the inner city schools to teach uh, course, something educa edu course, or something like that, education course, something like that. Very nice model. So they are bringing these preppy kids, you know, from Ivy League schools to the inner city to, to, to teach. And this person was the coordinator for the program. I said, I can get you one guy who would love to have you in, in his class. And we did it. So we went to, to a, a pre primary school in the South Side. We adapted Freire model of conscientization with a group of fifth grade African American students from an elementary school in the South Side of Chicago. Their ages were 10 to 11. Eight boys and six girls participated in the study. Specifically, this project attempted to provide students with the ability to identify, reflect, and act upon both individual and community level issues that concern them. The process was conducted with, a, with the active participation of the classroom teacher in all aspects of the project design and implementation. The students were divided into small groups and worked with an adult facilitator. The groups met twice a week for 90 minutes over a period of four months. Prior to the initiation of the classroom activities, we discussed extensively with the teacher and a group of African American community leaders the type of themes that would be more appropriate for classroom discussion and in-depth analysis. They concluded that focusing on helping the youth develop a better understanding of basic human values will be an appropriate goal for the intervention. Students were asked to engage in the process of discussing and analyzing the four basic human values of respect, fairness, freedom, and equality. Prior to the beginning of the program, we had a meeting with the parents of the students and secured <coughs> consent to participate. The students spent about a month in class discussion and other activities of value. These were the steps. The process started with a class discussion about the students' current understanding of the value. The students were assigned to small groups, and each one was asked to explain their understanding of the value of their own words. Facilitator took notes of the student responses on a poster board. Students were asked to provide examples of the value and to explain how they experience in their own lives. Then, second, students were asked to research the value and collect additional information from multiple sources. They were asked to interview family members about their opinions and experiences with the value, both positive and negative. They were also encouraged to look the definitions in the dictionary and so forth. We didn't have computers at the time. The information collected was presented to small groups. At this point, some family members <laughs> began to attend the classroom discussion because they were surprised that the kids were asking them questions. And the kids wanted to know from grandma or granda, what is freedom? Or what is justice? Or what is equality? So the people in the household, they became curious about this whole process. They started to come to the classroom. We organized field trips into the community to take Polaroid pictures. 
the time we didn't have the, everybody has cameras now. In those days, we had to have the Polaroid. That was the only way, very expensive. Each small group went into the community with adult volunteers. A lot of the parents went. And the students were the ones who determined what pictures to take. And they broke into small groups and engaged in extensive discussions about the content between positive and negative images of each of the values. And the group facilitator took notes. Finally, the students were asked to prepare posters to present their analysis to the value, uh, to the whole class. And at the end, there was this nice celebration and presentation. Every time the students were asked, what would you do to bring justice? What would you do to bring equality to your life, to your community, to your school? One of the things that happened was that the kids started, as a result of this experiment, uh, the first recycling program in the school. It was amazing. And everybody started asking, why <laughs> are these kids doing this thing? They also started doing cleaning up. And they involved their families, and they started cleaning up vacant lots in the community. So a lot of people eventually become involved. The whole school, and these were the 10 year olds, okay? But the whole school started to change. And they became very interested in this process. So I had, uh, about a couple of months ago, a faculty member from Proviso uh, Math and Science Academy came to visit me uh, because they were looking for a mentoring uh, opportunity. Uh, and they were looking for mentors in the faculty at UIC for the students. And we engaged in a conversation, and it turns out when I listened to her describe the school, I didn't know the school very much, that this school is, is very, it's a very cool school. It's an unusual school. It's a school that, that has a history um, that is relatively new, uh, but has a vision of, of a different kind of education, an education that is much more participatory, that, that want to engage the students in, in, and give them, the students, an opportunity to be more responsible for their own education. And when I start hearing these things, I go, a light bulb went into my head and said, geez, that's the project that I did, you know, years ago, 10 years ago. Would you be interested? And I would be happy to work with the, with the students um, that I could mentor to see if we can replicate the process. So I would like to invite now for uh, to come to the table, three students who are running this program at Proviso Math and Science Academy, Cassandra Crespo, Sandra Trujillo, and Daniel Chavez. Please join me here. We have been meeting for about a month, and we have been preparing the structure, the framework for the conversation, the structure for how the classroom is going to be teach. Uh, the teachers, I have two teachers here, uh, they have been extremely supportive and wonderful resources. But following his lead, this is peer education. So they are the ones, I am not involved, the teachers are not involved. They are the ones who are going to be actually running the classes and working with the students and doing the whole thing. So we decided that it could be actually engaging and interesting for you to, to try to, to hear um, a couple of, of, of aspects about the project. So that's why I took this opportunity to invite them to, to come and share with you their experience. Um, they only have one week when the class it started. This week, actually, it was the first class. So it's going to go for um, two months, no? I think about two months. So it, it is, we don't have yet too much data about, you know, what's happening with the class, but, you know, we, we know what it went into the process and, and, and so forth. So I'm going to ask Daniel first, why are you doing this? Hi, I'm Danny. Um, I'm just going to start off by talking about um, what research mentorship is and how all of that works. Um, it actually starts your junior year with Research Core, which is a class where you come up with the question and you research that and you work on it and you they teach you the process of like finding information, finding articles, and 
you know, just stuff like that, like what research needs to be done on the, that topic. And from there, you create a poster, and that's what we're gonna do. Like, yeah, I'll get more into that. And um, in the words of Mr. Edward Moyer, the founder of this program at PMSA, he said, from the moment you walk into in that door, we are here to help you learn how to pursue questions that are important to you, important to society, important to discipline, and to learn how to go from a question that's fairly small, fairly bounded, into something that can now, if you let it, allow you to take over your life. And that's really what mentorship is. Um, it's like the next step where two very dedicated teachers take the time to find each student a mentor. And we were lucky enough to have Mr. Fabrizio as a mentor, thanks to Ms. Schuller. She's the one that found it for us. She's amazing. <laughs> And um, what we're going to be doing, like Mr. Fabrizio said, is like another part of the same study he did a few years ago. We're going to be implementing a critical thinking curriculum in ILS class, which is um, Ms. Einhorn's class. She's back there also. She's um, allowing us to <laughs> she's allowing us to take over her class a couple days a week, and they'll get more into that when they start speaking. And um, we developed a curriculum from scratch using pa Paulo Freire's ideas of critical education with the help of Mr. Fabrizio and the knowledge we had on his past um, study. And I think that this is important because with critical thinking um, and understanding, it gives um, students an opportunity to like live their lives knowing that they could take um, action for their own thoughts and ideas and like they think for themselves instead of being told what to do, they stand up for themselves. And that's why this is important. Great. Thank you, Daniel. All right. So now Cassandra is going to share with you a, a, a few of the elements about how is it that they are going to be running the program this year. Um, well, like you said, my name is Cassandra. And how we are going to be presenting this, um, first we had to think, how are we going to you know, tell these kids that all around them there is oppression, and all around them people are being alienated every day. Um, and the answer was simple, we can't tell them. We can show them, and we can have dialogues with them, and, show, and then come with the realization that they themselves have been oppressed, they themselves have been alienated. So what we came up with, as Danny said, is a curriculum that um, pretty much shows them and gives them the, the structure to find out themselves through dialogue how they are being oppressed. Um, like he said, we started February 14th, and this is going to go through until April 6th. Um, the first class we used as more of an observation class to see how the kids would take to this because the second question we came up with was how are we going to engage these kids um we came up we saw, found a video uh we showed this video to them and they really took to it so we thought using videos um other people's experiences on oppression and alienation would help to engage them in the beginning of the class afterwards we started a discussion with the class and realized that a huge class like ILAS um, would not benefit. It would have to be small discussions in small groups. And with that, they would be more comfortable and opening up with their experiences. We also um, implemented activities that, we, that would help them come up with realizations of their own oppression and alienation. And towards the end of this curriculum, we're going to have them um, come up with presentations of what oppression is, how people have been oppressed and alienated, and also come up with um, solutions to this and how they can uh, implement this in their daily lives. Um, like I said, we barely started this, so we don't have as much information to give you, but we can tell you that on the second day, the students really took to the class and they were very engaged and the second day is when we really broke them up into their small groups and took them away from their cliques and that is when they really start seeing what we were trying to tell them and what we were trying to talk to them about and getting them engaged in not the dialogue. And I understand in terms of process 
uh, you, you, you heard the two themes that we are going to start with is oppression and alienation. And the second themes are going to be? Unity and solidarity. So we are going to be working on the solution towards the end, mm -hmm. you know, which is very important. And um, they are also going to do literature reviews. They are going to be interviews with people in the community and their families. And they are also going to go out taking pictures. And we are going to use the pictures. Uh, the pictures is a big thing for Freire. He uses pictures to teach the adults, uh, especially uh, illiterate, because of uh, the meaning and the facilitation for the process of learning to read and write uh, through visuals. Um, but the pictures also, as you mentioned, the movies, the pictures and the movies allow a context for dialogue and conversation that is really, really uh, what we are looking to promote. Now, uh, I also wanted to know, you know, what, uh, what are your expectations? And Sandra is going to uh, elaborate a little bit about what do you guys expect from this experience? We can only expect the positive. The first day was really rough, but as our teachers have said and Dr. Balcazar, the beginning is going to be hard. But after we took off, it, everything really is coming to place. At first, students were like, well, why are we doing this? You know, why is this important to me? They weren't really grasping what oppression was or alienation. And finally, we have come up with definitions, and they're really taking to this. We've done activities, and they're taking it seriously. They're talking about life, things that they weren't doing before. And we can only expect that after this experiment, that they'll become more aware of oppression and alienation, and not only aware, but how they can come up with solutions. And that's another big part of this, not only identifying oppression or alienation, but identifying solutions and how. One aspect that I found fascinating about this experience is that the, te the, the teachers, the facilitators, are the senior students that you are seeing here. And uh, this is, follows closely with the values and the vision that Freire has about what education is all about. The, the teacher is not necessarily the more learned person but it's a facilitator of this conversation. And that is what these students are going to be doing. We are discussing with the, with the instructors about the possibility that this will be looked and examined carefully as a model that hopefully could be replicated in the future, not only in this school, but in other schools. Because if you look at what is out there, there is a tremendous, in my opinion, sense of urgency for bringing students of all ages to a better understanding of the issues that they confront in their life and their capacity to transform their world. And I think that is a fundamental need, urgent need of this nation. I am profoundly concerned that the lack of critical consciousness and critical awareness among the population is going to lead us to electing a Hitler in this country. Because people are being sold, politicians like selling soap, and they are not making, they are treating the, the politics the same way they are treating the toilet paper, at, you know, without thinking much, and going for the flavor or whatever it is that they or the hair or whatever it is that they find compelling on the candidate that has nothing to do with the issues. It's very serious the crisis that is looming to this country. Because as we continue to let, you know, the politics be hijacked by uh, a, an un unconcerned electorate, an uncaring and uninformed electorate, we are in serious trouble. So to me, this is a fundamental re uh, responsibility of all educators, is help the students, you know, develop a critical view of the world, start being critical about everything in their lives. And hopefully, they will help us change this nation for the better. So with that, I thank you, and now we are going to take some questions. Let me just start this off. Listen, thank you very much. This was terrific. Uh, I, I, I share your, your 
notions about what we're dealing with uh, totally. Um, just on a lighter side, I'd like to also tell you that uh, I'm a graduate of Proviso High School. Cool. <laughs> you don't want to know what year, but uh, uh, quite a long time ago. But um, yeah, we've actually had some alumni out of that place that are quite remarkable people. Uh, Fred Hampton comes to mind. I don't know if you know who he was, but uh, I won't belabor that point right now. That's not part of this discussion. But anyway, this is the microphone, so if you want to uh, come up and address uh, any questions, ideas, uh, pontificate on what you think about what's going on here, be my guest. I want to also announce that <clears throat> this particular, we are actually um, going to put this online. It'll be on YouTube. Um, so hopefully, uh, maybe this can go viral to a certain extent and we can have many, many, many more people who have access to what has actually happened here today um, be made aware. Um, if you want to know how to get there, there's our email address right there below. It's openuniversityoftheleft.org and we will get this up probably within the next week. So if you go on to that website, there'll be a link. And uh, if you, actually, uh, uh, we have our entire history uh, since we started doing this, which has only been in, we, we could only afford this uh, uh, recorder uh, in the last year. So we've been doing most of our events uh, and we have been posting them online. So hopefully this will go beyond this room today. Anyway, uh, I'm just gonna open the mic up now. So come forward, it's all yours. This is a YouTube link. Yeah, YouTube. yes, it will be on YouTube. So if you go to that website, there's a link there, you hit that link, and it'll take you right there. Hi, I'd be, you had mentioned that it was rough on the first day when you were meeting with the other students. I'd just like for you to elaborate on that a little bit. Share some of the experiences, and why do you think that it was rough getting started? Because at the beginning, um the two eyelash teachers, Ms. Einhorn and Mr. Modi, were giving, they took like the first 10 minutes of class to talk about their class, and then we kind of just showed up like, oh, these seniors, you know? And they really weren't taking us seriously. But after they saw a few videos, and they, it really captured their heart about things that were going on in Africa and other parts of the world, that really opened them up to discussion. And then we asked them to write down reflections in a notebook, and it was still that kind of like chit chatty thing, like let's talk with our friends, it's not really important. So on the second day, Casey broke them up into different groups, people they probably hadn't worked with before. And that really got them to open up about who they were. They weren't afraid to show their real feelings because they weren't with people that were probably gonna judge them, which I thought was a really big problem, the judgment that exists in the classroom. But after that day, it was much better. Uh, what were the specific activities that you talked about that showed them that they were oppressed? Um, one activity after we had broken up the uh, students from their groups um, it was sort of like an icebreaker. It was where they were facing their partner, and they had to see, view them for about 30 seconds, memorize what they were wearing, and then they would get to change their appearance and their partner would have to guess you know, what was different about their appearance. We related that to how consumption, production, people are known for what their material things. Why, why is it that people who have pretty necklaces, jewelry, are more noticed than people that are, can't afford that? So we went into discussion about that and certain differences in different people and we even went on to uh, discussing it. They saw a person, you know, who needed help across the street that didn't look like they could afford things that they might have. Would they help them? So. I really appreciate you doing this. It is wonderful. What do you think of some of the issues of marginalization and experiences that young people like yourself are ex exposed to today? Um, I think one issue that a lot of our younger generation face is, like Sandra said, the judgment that we get from people, and always having to be up to date on fashion, on gossip, and that's a really huge factor on people being blinded 
by what is really going on around them. So um, I think like the society around us are just it, the entertainment, the like I said, fashion is all a big distraction from the bigger problem that that students fail to to really see until they have an intervention. There was something really interesting in my group. Um, we were talking about uh, one of the students brought up immigration, and another kid said, "Well, it's not that I don't care about immigration; it's that I don't know enough about it." And some other student brought up, "Well, even if we did have the information, we really don't care." So I think it's handing the students the information and opening their eyes as to why they should care. A group of students don't care because it's not personal to them, but the other group really opened their eyes and they were in front of each other so they were really looking at each other and actually they built on their own definitions and why it was important to each student. To what extent do you think that there are some issues of cultural clash um, or integration within the mainstream culture that you experience or your families experience that are there but they not necessarily surface easily. Um, I think that, like Sandra said, they, why is it important to them other people's problems? They don't realize that people around them, although they might not be the same race, the same ethnicity, they have problems that in the long run it, in, or indirectly will relate to them in some way. And they don't touch they only touch the surface of the issue, of their own issue. They don't go deeper into it, and they don't um, realize that there are solutions, that it may, it may take them, you know, going into a different community and seeing other people and, you know, start that diversity to see that, you know, with help of others, that you can really have a solution. I think it's great that this, the teachers are facilitating this experience for the students because, you know, think about it. How often a teacher will allow the class to engage in a conversation about oppression in their lives? It's a legal area. Yeah. <laughs> or alienation. Oh my God. I mean, it's like, the, and that's what I found fascinating. It's like the, the teachers, I, and I really admire, you know, your willingness to do this. Uh, they are the ones who control the speaker here. I mean, they have the power to either kill this thing or let it be. And, and that's, you know, I would love for this experience to be known more widely because, you know, we need more teachers that are willing to allow their students to have these conversations that are so central to their lives. All right, thanks for speaking today. Um, first, maybe for the professor and then the students to chime in. Uh, when you have criticism, there's often defensiveness, whether it's personal or maybe on behalf of someone else. How do you deal with that since uh, dealing with criticism in, in constructive ways is sort of a, an art and skill of itself that needs to be developed as well? Does it just happen naturally or do you find it develops and that's one of the benefits of this? Thank you. There are two dimensions to that, to that question. One is the criticism that happens within the study circle among the, the, the learners. Um, and Freire spends a great deal of time and effort instructing the facilitator on how to deal with conflict. For instance, people that are come to the table with different levels of experience in life, different levels of oppression. So the more oppressed people tend to be more on the sideline, okay, because of their own personal experience that becomes like handicapped. So the facilitator has to be key in, in understanding who talks, when, how, and how the other people are reacting, and how to bring everybody to communicate, to facilitate the dialogue, and to listen to the silence. Because you see, what he's doing is giving a voice to those who have been silenced historically. So that takes a skill, and that has been one of the elements of his um, process that has been scrutinized somewhat, is the challenge of dealing with the complexity and the diversity of the group and the participants. So that's one dimension. Now the other dimension is the critical view outside on how people bring this critical view of the world. 
that is looked, in my opinion, as a very important skill. What this means is that people are being forced or no, encouraged to change their perception about themselves as victims or uh, which could be the result of direct oppression for you know, landlords or you know, bosses or whatever, uh, but also a, a additional forces that alienate them from their capacity to do anything, and those could be political forces, religious forces, and so forth. So the process of, critical, of criticizing is a process of trying to remove the responsibility, because you see the system, the status quo, typically blame people from, for their own predicament. So you are poor because you are you know, illiterate, or you are a peasant, or you are ignorant, or blah, blah, or you are black, or whatever color. Uh, uh, there is always this victim blaming position there. The critical view encourages the, the, the learner to remove themselves from, from that position of victim and they start seeing the causes of their reality, the power struggle, the power differentials, the history, their own history, okay, to understand the predicament. And that is what they are doing in Africa and South America and throughout the world. It's basically bringing people to have a dialogue about the power imbalance in their life, who is the caste or the group that has everything, and who is them, why they don't have anything. So he uses the word favela, which is the word in Brazilian, in Portuguese, I'm sorry, to describe house. But the word house is a different house. Favela is the house of the poor. And you learn to write or read with the word favela, and you start asking, well, why do I live in a favela and you don't? <laughs> How come I have to live in a favela and you don't? So they are forced. What is the history? What is my history? What is his history? You see? So it, the, the dialogue, the critical awareness start helping people understand the relationships of power in their lives. So you see, there are two levels of that uh, process. Yes. Have you dealt with the issue of youth being marginalized in a ghetto of celebrity, entertainment, and lifestyle? Definitely. In our groups, um, when we did the, the 30 second activity of noticing yes. the other persons, um, one of the students changed sweater with another student. And when it was time to guess what had happened, what the change was, one of the students mentioned Oh, you changed that sweater because you couldn't possibly afford a sweater like that. So that brings up the idea of who can have what, or criticizing how the boxes are set, and what is acceptable because of the media, because of celebrities, because of what is out there. They don't yet know alienization and who they are completely on their own. Because first of all, uh, I've been reading that the new emphasis and, and college is going to be uh, okay, uh, jobs only. That uh, the, the, the less less critical thinking, which I which I think is a shame. Uh, I don't know who who is saying that, but but that I don't know if that is. Um I don't think that that's the direction where we should go. I think you have to have critical thinking yeah. because because what's happening. That the, as the states cut the budget, then the corporations come in, and they uh, and they, they're usually the ones that don't want uh, critical education. True, sure. true. Sure. One thing that is happening in America, and we live that every day, is the two rules that the Romans invented many, many, many years ago: give bread and circus to the people. No, so we have welfare for taking care of the well of, of the bread. And we have all kinds of 24-hour circus going on with all the stuff in the media in terms of sports plus celebrity plus music for everything. And there are developments that are really shocking. Like I was, I was in uh, Guadalajara for the, with my family over the holiday, and I learned about a new trend in corrido, the narco corrido. And oh my God, I have never listened to this thing, have you? But I hear it's very disgusting yeah. stuff. Uh, if it is rap and it's worse, no? More or less, because they are talking about the beheadings and the kinds of things that are very cool among the narco-traffickers uh, 
in, in Mexico. And the, and the shocking thing is that these guys are listening to this stuff. Okay, this is the music that is penetrating the, the young people's minds as it is wrapped among the black population. And if you look at the numbers of why is it that black, especially black males, are not going forward in their education, it's, it's not cool. If you are a good applied a student, a student, African American, you are not cool. You are full of white crap, they say. And then you don't want to be black. So, okay, so you are either, to be a black, you have to be either a pimp or a drug dealer. There are no alternatives in between, and that's the culture that you are trying to force everybody to be, you see? So we run into very serious problems with this circus running on out of control. Yes, sir? You actually touched on part of my question to the students, and I recognize it's way early in the program, so you may not know this yet, but I'm curious if you've uh, experienced any gender-based differences. Uh, how the young men versus the young women, are they responding to the program differently? Are, they, are there any differences that you have noticed so far? Um, well, in my group, uh, I did notice actually that the men actually participated a lot more than the women did. Um, the young girls that were there kind of didn't really pay attention much. Where when they did speak, it was about um, you know appearance and how society really has pressure on women and to look a certain way and to act a certain way. And that I, one of them said that they felt trapped. But um, most of the time, the men were speaking and were more open about certain problems that they had. Actually, in my group, it was a little different. In my group, it was the girls that were more into the discussion because um, I would say that there's these two kids in my group that are like, the popular kids of the class, the cool kids. And like, I feel like they didn't want to really talk much because they felt like they were going to judge each other, like stand each other, like it comes back to the judgment and you know, they have to be the cool kids, they can't have problems, everything's like their life is supposed to be perfect. So I think that's why the girls are responding more in my group. My group is a little bit like Casey's, the boys said something, but the girls challenged them a lot. So the boys would say something and the girls were like, no, you're wrong, it's like this. So we were kind of having a little bit of conflict. I just want to say I'm delighted that the Illinois uh, Math and Science Academy is involved in this and hopefully we'll see a bit of change in the new generation of people in, in science and engineering. Um, uh, I, and uh, well, I'd like to hear what people think about that. I, I, I'd also like it if we could hear from some of the teachers that were in, involved uh, in, in this. Would you like to comment? Uh, we have well, two teachers present. Uh, yeah, going to enact the curriculum in Daryl Einhorn's um, room. She's a fabulous teacher who I immediately identify as being the perfect person to work with, and she knocked her socks off on her own. So, uh, the interesting thing about our school and about this group of kids in particular three, two, one, right? Three years with me, two years with me, one year. That's the first year. So, I've had, and you three. And so, I, I had these kids for a number of years. and have been able to see them and work with them, and I engage in critical pedagogy. I, I let them essentially choose what they, at this point especially, um, there's nothing I can force on them, but then when you have three students willfully reading Paulo Freire, which I didn't even, you know, encounter until graduate school, that, that, that there's something that's happening about the self-selection that these, these guys have created for themselves um, is pretty amazing. Um, I was given the freedom to, to work in this way, uh, with other teachers in the department to create active learning and um, constructivist learning. And so this is the program and, and these kids are, are fantastic. Uh, and we were able to, to get the ability to work and the students have a lot of buy into this process. So it's been a real pleasure. Um, can I say something about your classroom? Uh, well, the number of actually the 
Yeah, well, yes, I've had all three of them before, and um, I'm thinking there's two from freshman year and one from sophomore year. So I, I sort of mirroring what Michelle was saying, that I listen um, to Dr. Fabrizio and think with all my heart that I wish um, schools would embrace this opportunity for students to um, construct their own learning and not think of teachers as the people who are pouring knowledge into their head, because I certainly don't feel like that's my role, but I would love to hear from you all how you feel um, this process has worked for you starting as freshmen coming in with a very different idea of what learning looked like and how that's shifted over time in the <coughs> four years you've been at the school and how you want to translate that into the curriculum you've developed with these students you're working for. With, sorry. Um, well, for me, I know that when I came here, and especially in ILAS, um, I kind of got a sense of empowerment where I could take control of my own education and implement it in ways that I wanted to and I felt were important to me. So this type of education really can be personalized by yourself, like, with, by you. So I know that that really gave responsibility to me, and I, I used it, but for me, I used it for for my own good and for the good of others, because I know I do um, talk about you know certain stuff like this with my peers. Um, same for me. ILAS I think is really important at that school. Ms. Oak Schuler, you're my first ILAS teacher, and she said to me on the first day, "Sit or stand, sit on the counter, whatever works for you." And that immediately got my attention. Like, what is this? <laughs> oh, and then after that. Those years of ILS with Ms. Einhorn, she used to be a lawyer, and I want to be a lawyer one day. And <coughs> their activities and their knowledge that they have really empowered me to go out and do something. I've been involved with Aspire, which is um, kids with Down syndrome and autism, and awareness for them. I've done work at Cabrini Green for a law firm. That, to me, I think that without this high school, I don't think that. I would have been so open so, to so many people and so many different ideas. Um, I also agree that having ILS with Ms. Einhorn for two years um, really made me the person I am today because you know, the third year I had ILS, it was completely different. The first year I felt so much more free and I feel like I learned so much more because I took it at my, at my own pace and I, she really taught me like how to stand up for what I believe in and the proper way of doing it. and. It was really like, life changing for me. Yeah, I got a question. Uh, what is the possibility to bring the, this program to the early years of school, like primary or junior high, before they get to the high school? Good question. Uh, Null. <laughs> uh, I, I, am, I am not in the School of Education. Um, no. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, this was an accident, actually. <laughs> it happened, uh, total accident, Michelle came out. It was, it was fabulous. It was an accident, you know, one of those things. Uh, uh, I have no idea. Uh, this will be something that will have to be, you know, I don't know. I agree. I think this thing has to happen earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, the kids. There is one model that I admire, uh, it's the Montessori uh, framework of education because it's very cool, it's very liberating, you know, it rejects the traditional power relationship between the teacher and the, and the, and the student and really encourages individualization and pushing your own abilities and the likes and so forth. So there is that framework for, for the early years. It's still very limited uh, and often expensive and private. You know, I know very little public schools that actually are following that. Because the country is obsessed with testing, mm -hmm. and everything that we do as educators is directed towards the stupid test. So that's the contradiction, that, that we are wasting our time and their time, you know, on this focus, because it's short-term memory, unfortunately. And, and that's all the energy that is happening. So except for that, uh, I am very pessimistic about, you know, real change coming. I don't know. I think it's going to take parents like yourselves to demand better education. 
more critical education. And what I do with my kids, you know, is, is I engage in conversations with them when I am at home. We as parents have that responsibility. That's the little thing that we can do as parents, is, is still this sense of critical view uh, to our kids while we are at home. It can become very annoying because they roll their eyes when I start asking questions about the, the plot or the commercial or this or that. But eventually they get used to be being annoying. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'm just finding this uh, discussion fascinating, and you know, I want to just compliment you for what you've done here. Um, I wonder if I could, however, um, uh, just throw out this idea to you too. I mean, um, and don't misunderstand me because I mean, I completely agree with you know the notion that um, you know the future is is young people. Obviously, this is true not only in America but it's true, you know, worldwide. But I. Uh, I think that this is an idea that could well be expanded upon. And what little I do know about um, a free air, I'm probably butchering that name. Is it, you say Frady? I'm not going to hear this. Frady. I wrote the arts. Uh, Frady. Okay. Um, what about adults? I mean, uh, American workers. I mean, we'll talk about, you know, if ever, you know, there was a need to. Um, raise consciousness, I would say, you know, look at the workplace. I mean, look at the condition that, you know, we find ourselves in. Um, it's atrocious. I mean, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just beyond words almost. Um, it, this is an idea, I think, and obviously, I mean, an employer is not going to be of any assistance in something like this. But it seems pretty evident to me that, you know, uh, and this would also apply to perhaps uh, school situations where you were running into an administration and, uh, you know, my experience with education has always been that, you know, uh, that's where most of the problem typically begins. It's right there at the top. Uh, that's where you're going to meet the greatest resistance to things like this because obviously, um, you know, they're afraid of change. Um, it terrifies them. But we know it's, it's necessary. We know this has to come. Um, why not find some mechanisms to try to expand like what you're doing here? Um, that applies to both on the uh, level of say high school students, which is what's going on right here, but you know, perhaps with workers, um, uh, sh surely there are people out there that would be interested in this if they were only made aware of, aware of this. And trust me, we're gonna try to help with that to the extent that we're able to with what we're doing here right now, That's putting great. this online. So, um, but I wonder if you could maybe talk to that. Well, uh, well put because you know the whole model is a model of adult education. This is a framework of adult education. We are borrowing it to teach the kids, but the original framework is adult literacy training. So, all of the leftists of the world unite, uh, and, uh, I couldn't help it. Uh, all of the leftists of the world have a study circles. This is the main mechanism that they use to train new members, to train union members, and to and it's a study circles where they, they help people understand the relationship of oppression, exploitation, marginalization, blah, 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 and, and move away from being victims and, you know, what I'm going to do. So unionizing and taking and participating and engaging and voting and buying some things and not buying other things, buying America, whatever it is the, 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 is critical in this case, um, then comes through. So, yes, this is like the, the most fundamental organizing strategy to help people understand because the alienation phenomena is common across society. I mean, the hegem a hege a hegemony of the society structure is one that protects ideology and uses ideology to, pro to perpetuate its dominance. So, it's very hard to break that, that bounding for people. And only through allowing and facilitating this communication, these conversations, having these kinds of organizations, and many more, where you actually come together to study, to read, 
to criticize common events, to volunteer in Wisconsin, to help other people, you know, organize unions and to understand why is it that it's so important that we come together. Uh, that is what, you know, it's all about. That's what social change uh, is all about. So yes, you are right on the money. I understand that there are a few people on National Lewis University uh, here in Chicago that are very engaged in that process of adult education and maybe sh you should invite some of those people to come to you. Yeah, I wanted to add that uh, if um, you want to look at Dorothy Stang, uh, School for Adults, High School for Adults is based on Freire's uh, uh, model and it's free and it's all run by volunteers, it's running for five years and uh, if you are interested just check it out. Mm -hmm. Also that I heard uh, last weekend I heard one of the teachers in, in the Latino community is uh, Alejandra Frausto, I don't know if you heard her, anybody know of her? Uh, she's dynamite, and I suggest that uh, uh, you invite her also to speak here or, or any other place. Uh, she has an incredible methodology to empower people. To, to She teaches chemistry, and she teaches the women to analyze what they're putting in their face, and <laughs> finding out they're putting arsenic and all yeah, the things. Yeah, poison. And, right. then, and then she teaches how to make your own uh, you know, cosmetics and so on. And of course, uh, many times saying, you know, you need that shit, you know? I mean, wh what is it for? <laughs> it's satisfying this uh, ideology of, of, of looking this way or that way. So anyway, that there is things going on, and uh, we should demand more of it. Yeah. But when they ask about a uh, school for the adults, that's uh, really important. Uh, we 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 need to we need to learn what the future is going to be, and we have to make it. And if we don't, it's not going to be done. It will be the same shit that we have now. Absolutely. You know, uh, have, did you hear about the Highlander the School? Of course. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was one of the seminal forces for the civil rights movement. I told my students, "Do you think that little Rosa Park was just an angry lady one day?" <laughs> that decided I cannot take it anymore. She went to Highlander. She was ready. She was prepared. She knew what she was doing. Okay? This real change doesn't happen as an accident, you know? People have to be trained, educated. We, we should have, you know, schools like that in every major city. I, I wonder if, if, if Saul Alinsky shop, what's the name of that place now? I wonder if they have any kind of program. What's the name of? Industrial area. Industrial, yeah. Do you know if they have any formal program of? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, but you know that you know they have the history. They would be a natural. I mean, they, they, they You guys with the University of the Left, you, you should have you know a policy going on in every day. You know. Uh, you mentioned uh, the the Highlander School. I'm sure you're familiar with the book. We make the road by walking. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Freire and Miles Horton. Correct. The founders. Yes. Correct. And, and Miles conveyed, you know, this kind of vision. is helping people understand, <laughs> take freedom responsibly, and change the world. Because it's about changing. We've got five minutes. A couple more questions. Well, it looks like we are ready to leave then. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Oh, she has a